Welcome to another virtual FOSS North event. Big thanks to our sponsors and partners. So welcome back everyone. Um, it's time for our next speaker, Simon Zier. So Simon, um, it's all yours. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm Simon Sir, uh, or Immersion. I work at uh, Sourcer Hut, and I'll be talking to you about uh, getting pixels on screen and Linux. <coughs> so um, I'm going to talk about uh, the kernel interface to get uh, pixels on screen and Linux. It's called the uh, kernel mode setting. It's part of uh, DRM. Um, so I've been working uh, in uh, the Wayland ecosystem for a few years. Um, I'm the Wayland maintainer, also maintainer of Sway, Double Roots, Western. Uh, so yeah, I've been working with KMS for a while, and um, I wanted to share that with you. So let's maybe start with uh, what is KMS? Uh, so basically, when uh, an app wants to get something uh, displayed on screen, uh, a regular app doesn't directly talk to the kernel. A regular app first talk to a compositor, uh, a display server. So for instance, uh, if I have a, a terminal application, um, it uh, renders an image, and then it hands over the image to X11 or Wayland. <coughs> And then the compositor is responsible for um, taking images from multiple clients, blending them together in a single image, and then the compositor talks to the kernel. Um, so yeah, that's the interface between the kernel and the compositor that we're going to talk about. Um, so the compositor here is uh, user space. It's running in user space. And um, it will hand over images uh, to uh, the kernel uh, via the KMS API. Uh, KMS has a common code, but also has a driver-specific code. Um, so for instance, the uh, i915 driver uh, will uh, drive um, GPUs produced by Intel. There are also drivers for all the vendors, uh, AMD GPU for AMD, and so on and so forth. And the driver will be able to directly uh, program the hardware. <coughs> so what's nice about KMS uh, is that uh, it's a unified interface. Um, so you don't need to write driver-specific code, basically. Uh, you can write code that works uh, on any GPU. Uh, and you also add, get very um, low level control uh, uh, and the GPU. So you, if you want to, do, to, to, to have a lot of control and to be able to take most of your GPU, uh, that's, the, that's how you can do it. So yeah, <laughs> why use KMS? Uh, the first thing I'd, I'd like to say is that don't, <laughs> because when you're writing a simple app, you, you don't really need to use KMS. Uh, if you're writing a calculator app, a terminal app, a video player, you don't really need to, to talk to KMS. You need to do, talk to Wayland or X11. And that way, um, the compositor that can do the, the work for you. Uh, but there are a few uh, use cases where uh, talking directly to KMS uh, is desirable. <coughs> so the niche use cases I'm talking about here is uh, when you want to have a program which has uh, exclusive access to output devices. So on screen, you only, sh only see this particular program. Um, and you really need a uh, low level control uh, over the GPU. So for instance, if you want to um, take care of uh, optimizations uh, for to display a video or something like that, um, then you can do it with KMS. So KMS users typically include display servers. So I've already talked about um, X11 
and Wayland compositors. Uh, but there are also a few other users, uh, like uh, media players and some, uh, so for instance, uh, I don't know if you know about Kodi, uh, but um, uh, Kodi has a KMS uh, backend. So if you want to have uh, to, in, in your new in home, have a media center, you can directly run Kodi uh, without any uh, X11 stuff or Wayland stuff. <coughs> There are also some embedded use cases. So if you want to have a Raspberry Pi, which displays, I don't know, the weather or something, you could use KMS to do this. Um, also for uh, virtual reality and extended reality, uh, KMS is often used because um, their latency is very important. So um, the games and the VR applications uh, typically want to reduce latency to a minimum and want to uh, remove the compositor from the equation and have uh, as low level access as possible. <coughs> um, yeah, so what should you, why should you learn about KMS? So um, the reason I personally learned about KMS is that I was, uh, I was, interested in uh, learning how it works and there's a hood. Um, but uh, it's also useful to contribute to existing projects. For instance, if you want to contribute to Wayland Compositor or to Kodi, or I don't know, anything like this. <coughs> and if you need to write a new program uh, described in the use cases uh, I just talked about before, then you can, uh, you, you also need to learn about KMS. Uh, so, here I'm doing this presentation here because um, there are some docs, uh, some good documentation about KMS, but it's mostly for drivers. Uh, so typically uh, GPU vendors uh, who want to, to write a, a Linux kernel driver for their GPU, uh, <coughs> they need to learn about KMS. Uh, so there are docs for this, but it's not really um, very, it's not a good, a good way to, to, to learn the user interface, is a user uh, space API, basically. <coughs> because uh, the, the docs uh, describe a lot of uh, internal uh, kernel uh, functions and stuff like this. So it's pretty confusing. So um, KMS lacks some docs. So I'm trying to fix this. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> that, that's the whole point of this talk, basically. And uh, very few people know about KMS and how it works, how, how the even driver developers don't know how the uh, user space API works. So uh, I think it's very important to get more people on board. So yeah, let's get started. How do we get an image on screen? So we'll try to display a, a red uh, image, a solid red image on screen with KMS. <coughs> I won't care a lot about uh, leg legacy APIs. There are some legacy APIs in KMS because uh, it wasn't perfect from day one. So uh, there's some historical baggage. Uh, we, we're going to skip all that and just use the latest stuff. So that means it only works on uh, mostly recent GPUs. So in practice, an in Intel, it works well. Uh, and uh, AMD, you need a recent -ish. If you have an old AMD card, it won't support the, the new APIs. But if you have uh, something that not, not so old, it will be fine. <coughs> so yeah, let's start with uh, opening the GPU. So opening the GPU is the first thing you need to do. And it's pretty simple. It's basically just. Um, so open syscall. Uh, we'll open a file called slash dev slash dri slash card zero. Um, if you have multiple GPUs, you'll have multiple of those. So card one, card two, and so on and so forth. And there you have it. You have a file descriptor uh, with the, <coughs> the primary node. We call this a primary node. And you, you will be able to uh, control the GPU with the, this uh, file descriptor. Uh, so in practice, um, if you write a real um, KMS application, you maybe want to list the devices with UDAV, libudev or something. <coughs> uh, 
uh, in our slides, I don't uh, I leave uh, error handling uh, out of the way. Um, so that's something you'll need to care uh, about when if you write a real client as well. So the first thing you'll want to do uh, with the DRM file descriptor is to get a list of resources. DRM exposes <coughs> multiple different resources. Um, so here we can see that there are different types of resources. FBs are frame buffers, are CRTCs, connectors, encoders. So all of these uh, have arrays of uh, UIN32 uh, items. These are object IDs. <coughs> so KMS exposes um, objects with IDs, and each ID, each object has a type. Um, so yeah, frame buffers, CRTCs, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'll do a little demo here. Uh, a friend of mine uh, wrote a little call, a tool called the uh, DRM info, which just lists everything uh, it can uh, it can display about KMS. So that's quite a lot of information. But uh, we can see that we have a bunch of connectors here, and each connector has a lot of uh, properties. Um, I have two connectors, three connectors, four connect, yeah, five connectors total. There's a bunch of encoders, CRTCs with uh, each object IDs and properties, and other stuff as well. We'll see about that in a moment. <coughs> so once we have these object IDs, we we'll want to um, get more information uh, about the objects because an ID. Uh, it's just an ID. <laughs> we don't care about, that, about the ID that much. Um, so let's start with connectors. So connectors are just physical connectors on the back of your GPU. So some types of connectors you might be familiar with uh, are DisplayPort, HDMI, VGA, uh, USB-C nowadays. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty straightforward. <coughs> um, so once you have a connector ID, you can use the DR mode get connector function to get the DR mode connector object. And it has a bunch of um, fields. Uh, it has a connector type, uh, which I just talked about. It can be display port, HDMI, and so on. Um, there's also a field called connection, which says whether uh, something is plugged into the connector or not. Um, you can use this. <coughs> uh, you can also have a bunch of other stuff like the size of the screen in uh, millimeters. Um, so typically, um, you could you could think that um, the list of connectors on your computers uh, is a fixed list and doesn't change at one time. But uh, when nowadays, that's not the case anymore because you have things like uh, USB-C docks uh, with, where you pl plug in uh, a, a USB-C connector and then you can have multiple uh, display port or HDMI connectors at the back of the hub. So uh, the list of connectors can change at one time. That's pretty fun to handle <laughs> in, in code. Uh, each connector has a, a list of uh, modes it supports uh, if a, a screen is, is, is plugged in. <coughs> so modes are basically a, a, a resolution and a refresh rate. Uh, each, each screen has a fixed set of, of supported modes. Uh, so for, let's take an example, for instance, on my GPU. I have a display port connector here, uh, which is connected to a screen. You can see the size in millimeters. And here we can see that I have a lot of modes here. It's the, my connector supports a lot of modes. So 4K modes, but it can go back to 720p <coughs> if I want. Uh, so I can pick any of these. And uh, there's a refresh rate here in, in Hertz. So it's pretty important to, to, to say that the uh, refresh rate is fixed. 
and uh, cannot be changed. Uh, also, if you want to switch from one mode to another screen, you'll probably get uh, a black screen during a few seconds during the mode set operation. <coughs> so you don't want to do that uh, a lot <laughs> uh, because that's not very good uh, user experience. Um, so um, let's see if I can um, write a little uh, KMS client that just lists uh, all the modes supported by my connectors. So um, I can get uh, use uh, DRM mode get connector function I talked about earlier. Then check if the connection is connected, if something is plugged to the connector. And once I know that, um, I can print uh, the list of modes, um, iterate over the list of modes here, and just print the edge display, v display, and v refresh. Uh, and that's about it. So I'm maybe going to show you the final code here. Uh, so you'll be able to find the code in a Git repository at the end of the talk. But uh, that's basically the code on the slide in a file, and I compiled it. And if I run it, you can see that for the connect for this connector, uh, I have the list of modes uh, that uh, DRM info um, printed earlier. <coughs> so yeah, we got a list of modes. Cool. So now that we have a list of modes, let's talk about uh, frame buffers. Frame buffers are basically uh, how we're going to display something uh, on screen, and it's a slice of memory containing pixels. So frame buffer have an object ID, uh, an object ID. Um, they also have a width and a height. Um, this pitch here, it's also sometimes called the, the stride. <coughs> it's the number of bytes in each uh, pic row of pixel. And there are all, some other stuff, so, so like, Dev, we don't care a lot about it, but uh, BPP is the uh, bits per pixel, number of bits for each pixel. There's also a, a handle um, <coughs> for each uh, FB, for each frame buffer. So the handle is a driver specific handle and it's separate from the frame buffer ID and it will be used to uh, import a frame buffer into KMS because KMS can't uh, directly um, uh, allocate buffers or anything like that. We, we're going to use something else and then import the frame buffer into KMS, get a frame buffer ID uh, to import it. Yeah, we're going to use this handle. Uh, so frame buffers, uh, they also have a format. And the format describes how pixels are laid out in the buffer. So there are a bunch of different formats. Uh, the list can be found in DRM4CC.h. <coughs> Some very commonly supported formats are XRGB8888 and ARGB8888. So what does this mean, basically? How to interpret this DRM format? Um, so let's take, for example, the color 112233. So the red component set to uh, 11 in X, J component to 22, and B component to 33, and then alpha component set to um, completely opaque, so FF. Then how do we express this color in these two formats? So, so yeah. <laughs> Let's start with ARGB8888. Um, the so the, the first part here describes uh, the order in which uh, the components are laid out in, in memory. And then the second part here with the 8888 describes how many bits per component there are. So here we start with the A component, so alpha component, <coughs> with eight bytes, uh, bits, sorry. 
Uh, then the red component with eight bytes, J components with eight bytes, and B components with eight bytes. But you may notice that uh, in uh, the bytes I wrote here, the A is at the end here. <coughs> That's because there's a little gotcha. Um, DRM um, formats uh, are expressed in Little Indian. So uh, you basically need to read them backwards uh, to store the byte in memory. So you need to start with B. Uh, B is 3-3, three, three, and then J, 2-2, two, two, and then R, 1-1, one, one, and then A, F, F. So yeah, need, a need to be a little bit careful about this. And uh, also other formats, like uh, OpenGL formats, are in Big Indian. So you need to yeah have a mapping table which takes care of the uh, mapping from DRM formats to, to OpenGL formats. <coughs> so these are pretty simple formats. There's another example. Um, there are also some more complicated formats, for instance, XRJB to one, no, two, ten, ten, ten. So X means, means uh, some bytes are not used. So here I, I have two bytes at the beginning that are not used. Then 10 bytes, uh, sorry. Here I have two, two bits uh, that are not used. Then uh, 10 bits for R and 10 bits for G and B, J and B. There are also some more complicated formats, YUV and multiplanar formats, but we're not going to talk about this. Yet. OK, so now I know about formats, and I know about DRM formats. So we're going to see how to allocate a frame buffer. So we're going to use something called uh, DRM uh, dump frame buffers. Um, so to allocate a, a, a dump buffer, <clears throat> so dump buffer I call this way because they are pretty simple. Pretty inefficient, but pretty simple. So we're going to start with that. Uh, I'm going to perform manually uh, an IOC tool um, called create dump. I'm going to pass the width and the height of the um, uh, frame buffer I want to create, and also um, the bits per pixel. Uh, so if I want to use the DRM format XRGB8888, the bits per pixel is 32. <coughs> So once I've performed this IOCTL, I get back a handle, a stride, and a size. I'm going to use all of this information later. And you can see that the handle here can be used to import uh, the frame buffer into KMS. So yeah, let's import. Let, talking about importing <laughs> into KMS, uh, this is done uh, with the DRM mode add FB2 function. So it takes the DRM uh, file descriptor, the width, the height, the format I want to use. It also takes the handle, the stride I, I, I got back from the create them IOCTL. And that's all. Um, it gives back a frame buffer ID, um, which I will, be, I will be able to use this uh, object uh, later on. Um, you configure the screen to display it. So now um, I have allocated the frame buffer. Uh, I have imported it into KMS, but the frame buffer is empty or has undefined uh, contents. So I need to write into the, the, the frame buffer um, to paint uh, everything in red. So I'm going to use um, an IOCTL called uh, map dump. <coughs> so this IOCTL takes a uh, handle and gives back uh, an offset which can be used in uh, mmap call with the DRMFD. So yeah, it's a lot of boilerplate, but the uh, end result is that I get a data pointer. So it's just a regular pointer. I I, it's a slice of memory. I can just write into like any other memory uh, and just write pixels. Um, and then they will uh, be copied to the GPU automatically. <coughs> OK, cool. So I have now a frame buffer. I can paint it, paint it in red uh, by writing into the data pointer. And I also have a frame buffer ID uh, I can use. Uh, to, so 
how can I use this from a ID to, to display something? We are going to need to talk about uh, a few more objects. So we already talked about frame buffers and connectors. We need to talk about planes and CRTCs. <coughs> it's two of our types of uh, KMS objects. And basically, the pixels will flow from the frame buffer to the plane, then to the CRTC, then to the connector, then to the actual screen. <coughs> so you might be wondering, why do we have these two extra objects? Why can't, be, can't it be more simple? And uh, why can't the pixels flow directly from the frame buffer to the connector? So the, the reason why CRTCs exist uh, is that we have a feature called the uh, clone screens. Um, it's when you want to have the, 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 the same image displayed on two different screens. So for instance, if you have a projector and you need to do a presentation about KMS, then you maybe want to have the same image uh, on your laptop and, and the projector. Um, so maybe, uh, yeah, in, in some cases, it's possible to uh, use the same CRTC connected to multiple connectors. So the pixels from, flow from the frame buffer to the plane and then the CRTC. And then the image is duplicated and both connectors. <coughs> so yeah, two connectors wide up to a single CRTC. That's the reason why CRTCs exist. So CRTCs, their name, uh, don't pay too uh, attention, uh, attention to it. Uh, it comes from CRT, cathode ray tube, con that cathode ray tube but uh, the name is meaningless nowadays. It's just there for historical reasons. So now planes, why do we have planes? Um, the reason we have planes is that uh, <clears throat> some GPUs can uh, display multiple uh, frame buffers uh, on a single uh, CRTC. Uh, for instance, here, I'm talking to you uh, with uh, the presentation in the background and a little camera. Um, so all of this uh, uses one plane and uh, my cursor, which I move around here, uses another plane called the cursor plane. <coughs> the primary plane for uh, all my desktop and the cursor plane for just my cursor. So this allows power savings and a more efficient use of the GPU. Uh, so, yeah, in my case here, the compositor attaches uh, both planes to a single CRTC and uh, both frame buffers are displayed uh, at the same time. So, um, maybe, yeah, we, we can just like uh, connectors, uh, we can get more information about CRTCs with the DR mod get CRTC function, which takes a, a, an object ID, the CRTC ID, and gives back this DR mod CRTC structure. <coughs> it has a bunch of information, um, like the mode currently used and the CRTC. Mm, yeah, we don't care about this a lot. Um, Planes. Planes also have a function to get, um, but, but they work a, a, a little bit differently. So the first thing we need to, to do to, to use planes uh, is to set a client capability, uh, universal planes. It's just to say uh, to KMS, uh, hey, I'm not a legacy client. I support the, the new APIs, so don't worry about me. And then KMS will let us use uh, all the planes. Once we've done that, um, we can use the DM mode get planes resources function to get a list of planes. Uh, we get a list of plane IDs. And then we can use the DM mode get plane function to get <coughs> plane structs. Plane structs also have a bunch of. Uh, uh, fields here. Uh, the most interesting one is probably the formats array. It describes all the DRM formats uh, supported by a plane. So, for example, we 
with DRAM info, I showed the list of connectors, but <clears throat> we can see also the list of CRTCs here. Uh, and the list of planes. Uh, so for instance, here I have a plane with uh, all of these formats supported. So there's XRGB8888, I talked about earlier, but a bunch of different other formats as well. Uh, yeah, so you can use this tool, DRM info to list all capabilities uh, on your GPU. It's pretty handy when developing a DRM application. Um, so, We've talked about uh, a lot about uh, reading some uh, some fields here from the DRAM mode plane, DRAM, DRAM mode connector, DRAM mode CRTC uh, structures. But how do we change those? So we are going to use something called object properties. So as, as I've said, <coughs> KMS exposes um, objects uh, with, with which have an ID, a type, but these objects also have properties. Um, so we can list the properties with DRM mode object get properties. Um, we just uh, provide the uh, object ID and the object type, and it gives a list of properties. Uh, so property IDs as always. So yeah, you can you can start to see a pattern here. Uh, once you have a property ID, we can use DRM mode get property to get uh, the property uh, struct. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, the most interesting, interesting uh, field is probably the name uh, because uh, it's human readable, so it's pretty handy. Uh, we can see that properties also have values, uh, which are uint64 <coughs> uh, items. So here, when if I go back to my to my plane here in DRM info, uh, we can see a properties uh, node with um, a, a, a property named type, uh, which is set to primary, uh, a frame buffer ID uh, property also set to one hundred and twenty seven. So, yeah, basically what we want to do here. I have a frame buffer ID I, I allocated earlier, and I want to pick a plane, set the frame buffer ID property to the FBID I created earlier, and then I'll be done, basically. So I'm going to just uh, write a little uh, helper called get property value. <coughs> Uh, it will take an object ID, an object type, and a human readable uh, string for the property name, and just iterate uh, over the list of properties, compare if the name matches uh, the inputs, and then just return the value if that's the case. So that's just a little helper to get a property value from a name. Um, and with that, I'm going to be able to yeah, so basically the function is just there. <clears throat> to, uh, I, will, I will, so my end goal is to set the FBID property on a plane, but I first need to select uh, a CRTC and a plane um, I'm interested in. So yeah, well, for simplicity, uh, we're just going to pick the first CRTC that is currently lighted up. So uh, we're going to iterate over, uh, over all CRTCs and uh, check if mode valid, mode valid is true. And if that's the case, uh, we just pick this CRTC. Uh, so we're going to use the mode currently set in the CRTC. <coughs> so just logging it here for debug purposes. And then we're j just going to try to uh, iterate over the list of planes, get the plane object, and read the property value for the type, and check if the type is primary. And if it's a primary plane, uh, then I'm going to use this plane to set um, the frame buffer on it. Uh, so if I just run this thing, oh. 
Eh, I can type apparently. Okay. Uh, I just picked a CRTC, 45 on a plane, 31, <coughs> that I will be able to use to display my frame buffer. So I should have now uh, almost all the tools uh, I need. Uh, the only missing piece is how do I set the FBID property to change it to my uh, the, the FBID I allocated. So I'm going to use something called atomic commits. Um, but you might be wondering, hmm, atomic commits, why is there atomic in there? <coughs> because I could, that, that could just be a function that just sets a frame buffer uh, to the one I want, to the frame buffer I want, and I'm done with that. So actually, well, that, that's how the legacy API worked. But it had a few issues. Uh, for instance, uh, if I wanted to uh, update the cursor plane, so when when uh, when I move the mouse, sometimes it moves over. Um, so it moves and it can change the the, the cursor icon also. <coughs> so the compositor might want to do both at the same time. Um, so. When using the legacy API, there was a one request, so one uh, IOCTL to set the cursor plane frame buffer, and another request to move the cursor. So the compositor will do one and then the other. And the issue is that is that the monitor uh, reads at a very fixed refresh rate uh, the CRTC image, the CRTC output. Uh, so what might happen? is that the uh, compositor sets a cursor plane frame buffer, then the monitor reads uh, the image, and then the, compos the compositor moves the cursor. And I end up in the situation where um, the cursor hasn't moved yet, but has already changed the image. So that might not be uh, a big issue for cursors because it's not that important for cursors. But uh, as you could see, there are a lot of other uh, object properties. Uh, so if you want to change a lot of properties at once, you might end up in a, a bad state, <coughs> a state where uh, something, uh, Part of the image is new, and part of the image is uh, the previous uh, image. So that's not great. Another issue with um, legacy APIs, so having two requests, uh, multiple requests to change uh, each property, um, is that sometimes uh, the KMS can say the GPU is not capable of doing something. So for instance, if I set a plane frame buffer, KMS may, might say, OK, that's fine. And then after, if I try to move the plane, uh, KMS might say, I can't do that. And then if I'm in the position of the user space here, it's a little tricky because I need to fall back. Uh, I need to handle this grace gracefully. Um, but Already, I'll, I, I've uh, already set uh, half of the state, and uh, half of the state couldn't be uh, set. So I need to roll back the plane frame buffer to the previous one, and then try to do something else. But that's pretty involved. So when something goes wrong, it's not easy to to roll back to the previous configuration. So atomic commits fix this by. Um, providing a request to set multiple properties at once uh, in an atomic fashion, all at the same time. So a request to set the plane frame buffer and move the plane at the same time. And then uh, this, fix this fixes both issues I talked about just, yeah, just earlier. <coughs> so in practice, uh, atomic commits are a list of um, properties to set an object. So uh, I'll say on this object, I want to set FBID to this value, and I can add a bunch of these. So how do I do that in code? Uh, the first thing I need to do is set the uh, atomic client capability. 
you say to the kernel, hey, I support the atomic interface, no need for legacy things. And then uh, I'll allocate uh, something called an atomic request. <clears throat> And I'll be able to add uh, multiple uh, properties to this request. Uh, for instance, an uh, object ID uh, for the plane. Uh, I'll set the prop ID for the FB ID property to the FB ID I allocated earlier. And this will uh, set the new um, FB ID. I can do that a lot. I can add a, a bunch of more, a bunch of properties. And at the end, when I'm done adding all the properties, I'll submit everything at once with DRM mode atomic commit, which set the request and a few flags. We'll talk about this. <coughs> and that's about it. OK, we're almost done here. Uh, I'm just going to write a little helper called add property, add property uh, which takes a request, an object ID, an object type, a property name as a string and a value. So it works very similarly to get property value uh, I described earlier. Uh, it just iterates over all the properties, uh, finds the one that matches the name uh, provided, and then calls the mode atomic add property. It adds uh, the, the, the property and the value to the atomic commit request. OK. So. To display a buffer, uh, I've said I just need to set the FB ID property, but I lied a little. We need to set a few other properties as well. Uh, these other properties are CRC, uh, so the source rectangle and the destination rectangle. So the source re rectangle is um, set with the four uh, add property calls here. Uh, the source rectangle is used to crop a buffer. So if you want to have a frame buffer and only display uh, a subset of it, you're going to set the source uh, coordinates to something to, 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 to a rectangle smaller than the full uh, buffer. But here I'm not interested in that. So I'm going to just say uh, x, y to 0 and width height to the width and height of my frame buffer. There's, yeah. There's a little, um, you need to shift uh, the width and the height uh, by uh, 16 uh, bits here because um, the source and uh, so the source rectangle is given in a fixed point uh, coordinates. So, yeah, if you need to, yeah, it doesn't matter that much, just something to care about. The other thing we are going to, to do is set the destination rectangle. So this allows to scale uh, a frame buffer. So if, if I have a small frame buffer and I want to scale it to be larger, uh, I can do that with uh, the destination rectangle. I'm not interested in that. So I'm just like the source rectangle, I'm going to set it to the full frame buffer. Uh, once I'm done with that, uh, I can just perform an atomic commit I'm going to set the flags to non-block uh, because I'm not interested in waiting for the frame buffer to be displayed on screen or anything. So I just want to return as soon as possible and uh, queue the atomic commit. So that was a lot of things <laughs> to do. I, 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 I did the presentation. It, uh, that was quick. <laughs> I, I hope you coached that. So, I collected everything in a show FB function. Uh, so yeah, basically it's all the code in the slide just in a single function. Get property, value, add property. Uh, there's the code from earlier to select the CRTC and the plane. There's the code from earlier to allocate the buffer uh, and to create the memory mapping. I've added some code to fill the, the frame buffer, to write to the frame buffer with a solid red here, uh, BGRX, and R is set to FF, so plain, plain red. 
Uh, I'm just copying the, the pixels uh, to the buffer here. And then I submit the atomic commits with the FBID set to the FBID I got earlier. <clears throat> and that's about it. Sleeping for a few seconds so that I, uh, I can see the, the result. That's about it. So I have a camera here set to uh, my uh, demo computer. I'm just going to run uh, my demo here. We can see that uh, it allocated the FB and uh, used uh, the CRTC 45, blade 41. And we can see that <laughs> the screen is red. So we finally managed to display something on screen. I have another demo which um, animates the FB a little bit. So it's, so it's a little bit cooler. Uh, yeah, you can change the color of a time just by writing to the buffer in a loop and uh, submitting uh, atomic commits in loop. Uh, pretty simple. I don't know if you can see it here, but there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's some tearing. Uh, so basically there's some mismatches sometimes. Um, so the, the colors are mixed a little. That's because it's completely missing any synchronization. So we need to add some double buffering in there to, to be able to fix that. But I, I won't have time to, to talk about this. Uh, yeah, there you have it. Uh, red screen uh, with KMS. Um, so there's a lot of other stuff to, to do with KMS. This was just an introduction. So there are a bunch of other objects we need to do. And to perform a mode set, it's a little bit more involved. Uh, you might also want to handle batch flip events, um, which say when, uh, when a buffer is finally displayed on screen. Uh, to prevent tearing, you, you might be interested in double buffering. Uh, you might also be interested in hot plug events to know when uh, a new screen is plugged in or unplugged. Uh, atomic test only commits allows to query some uh, if hardware supports a particular capability or not. And you might also be interested in uh, integrating with OpenGL uh, to draw because drawing with dumb frame buffers, uh, it's good for demos and for simple cases. But to take advantage of the GPU, you likely want to use something like OpenGL uh, to, to draw uh, stuff on screen. And there are also a bunch of other things you might be interested in. I just put it there if you want. Uh, also demos, you can find it, uh, find it in, in a Git repo. There's also a few res other resources uh, about KMS. DRM info, the tool I talked about, uh, is available here. I built also a DRM database of uh, DRM info dumps to know which GPUs support what. And yeah, kind of check with it at uh, DRI Devil and Freenode. That was it. So um, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks a lot for, for the talk. Uh, we have some questions that have come in on the on the YouTube live chat. Uh, the first question was, what if I what if I use a different offset than the one provided in the map? Would it be <laughs> possible to access the memory region I'm not supposed to access? That's a good question. Uh, so the question is about. Let me find it. Allocating, yeah. Here I have a M map and the DRM FD with an offset here. And the offset is provided by the map done by your CTL. <coughs> so I think uh, it will just fail, but I haven't actually read the code. So uh, I'm not sure. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I should read the code for this uh, map them uh, function. Uh, in the kernel and find out. I don't know. <laughs> my guess is it it would fail. Yeah, that that would make sense. But it's always it will always <laughs> nice to know know for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, a question. A second question was uh, what was it that made you look into learning these APIs? Are you working with VR or something like that that promoted the uh, interest? 
So I originally worked on this uh, because I started getting interested in Wayland. So I started contributing to Sway and WLWoods. Uh, so WLWoods is a library to write uh, Wayland compositors, and it uses KMS. So I just wanted to improve WLWoods. Uh, so a friend, uh, Scott Anderson, wrote a lot of the KMS uh, stuff in WLWoods, but I eventually needed to change some things. Uh, all of this was pretty obscure at the moment, uh, at the time. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, over time, I just learned more and more about KMS and finally got to the point where I am now. But yeah, <laughs> it was pretty difficult to, to, to get there. Uh, since then, the, some new resources um, are now available, like the Scott Anderson uh, DM doc and Daniel's KMS quads. Uh, so maybe that helps. But uh, yeah, uh, we definitely need to improve docs again, <laughs> once again. Uh, so yeah, the reason was W roads. It's, it's, it's the usual case that you started with something small and then you just got in deep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, can, uh, I can relate. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then there was a question, which repository contains DRM info? But that's the one shown on this slide, right? Yeah, you can uh, just click on this link uh, and then it will, yeah. It's pretty simple to build. Uh, yeah. yeah, just try and, it. And uh, we, we'll make sure that the slides are available later on the FOSS North website as well. Cool. All right, I think that's uh, all the questions we had for this talk. Thank you very much, Simon. No problem. Um, and I'll hand over to Johan. Yeah. Big thanks. Uh, we will have another nine minute break and, and I'll see you at 11. Thank you all.